People don't get into the radio business without motivation. The motivation arises from many sources. Technical interest, passion about news or sports, even the desire to become a local celebrity. To be a success, Harrison needed to make sure that, in addition to personal motivation, a new job applicant also possessed the talent and intelligence to be successful. Making the decision on a person's qualifications for a job at WJMA seemed as much of an art as a business skill. I used to use ads in Broadcasting Magazine, which was something like that. We can't promise you uh, whatever it was, but we'll give you a good opportunity to learn something in a nice, small, congenial, small market station. So I'm really grateful for the station being here, and I'm extremely grateful for Arch for, for taking the chance. Because had I seen me back in 1973, I would have thrown me out and not looked twice. And Arch looked past all that. And Arch, there was something that Arch saw that, that he wanted to go ahead and, 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 and work with it. And, and so, you know, and everything that I, I ever achieved in radio, I got because I got my ground, I got my roots here. First of all, I'm amazed that I was ever hired uh, because I still have my original tape. It sounds like my vocal cords are, are frozen. I mean, it's just this, this horrible monotone and this kind of, you know, and I wonder how, how did Arch ever see anything in that? I mean, if I'd have been in his shoes, I think I'd have patted the boy on the head and told him to <laughs> go get a job on a farm or something because you definitely don't want to do radio announcing. I walked in one day and met Pat Watson and I walked in the front door the green tile floor that sat in front of her desk. And uh, she looked up over her glasses and said, what can we do for you? And Arch came walking out and, oh, it's just music to my ears. He says, so I understand you might be the answer to our prayers. <laughs> I'm looking over, <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> and I have to say that in no other job I've had have I found anybody who was quite as inspiring or as well regarded as Arch was. He, he was a good reader of people. I mean, that, you know, that, I, I can't say enough. I don't think this guy ever really beat me up about anything. It's like, you know, again, he was always interested in, in his people. Yeah, he, was, he was one of a kind. He, um, I never, in all my days on radio, I never really met another guy like him. There's nothing worse than, than, than bosses who only point out what's wrong and never give you an attaboy. Um, and I certainly never felt that. I felt that I was appreciated. You're going to mess up. Don't worry about it. That's part of, you know, you're, you're, you're going to go on the air and you're going to, you're going to mess something up. You're, you know, that's, that's going to happen. Uh, just try not to let it happen again. You know, learn, learn from your mistakes and, and, you know, be prepared. I don't think during the stretch with Jamie anybody was particularly afraid. I know I wasn't to make a mistake. We didn't like making mistakes, but we were never afraid to make a mistake. And thus, I think because when you're not afraid, then that whole creative side comes out in people. And uh, it's what makes it, makes it kind of special. The environment for doing that anymore, I don't know that it exists. If it does, I'd love to find it. And that's, I think that's why the memory stays so fresh in your mind. I had a feeling that Arch was, you know, cultivating, he was just looking for people that had some sort of a, an intellectual fundament, you know, had some sort of a bottom to him. I felt uh, getting the best people you could get, tell them roughly what you wanted to do, wanted it done, and then let them go to it. People were willing to give somebody a chance. And they, they knew you could contribute something, and it was great. Whatever you gave them was wonderful. You never felt like it wasn't uh, appropriate. And that was true throughout the whole station experience. People took pride in what they were doing, and you didn't just, uh, and, I, and I don't say this was 100% of the time, because there's always people who get in a hurry, but the, the overriding sense you got there was it, it wasn't good enough to just throw it up against the wall. You, 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 you did it until you got it right, and you, you took pride in what you did. Mainly, I believe, it evolved from the input of this very solid, reliable staff that we had. People who were not afraid to express ideas, who had good ideas and, and we could work with them. Um, I believe uh, the whole thing seemed to me a kind of a learning experience. I never came and said, this is what we're going to do. We just sort of said, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to give that a try. 
Arch was a real different kind of manager. He was a manager in the sense that, like an army general, he didn't. He wasn't like a captain or a lieutenant. I mean, he would talk with you about some ideas, but basically, it was up to you to do the, and you would go to him with the ideas. We didn't have much turnover, and Arch hated turnover. I recall him telling me, perhaps when I was tendering my resignation once, um, uh, he said, you know, this is the hardest part of this job, is losing people and having to find somebody else that will fill the slot. He says, I just don't like that part of the job. Arch was great. You know, he, he was like, I don't know, like right out of a fairy tale or something. He'd just kind of putter around in his cardigan sweater and, you know, just, well, you know, just get here and there. And, and, but he was really hands off, you know, unless you kind of screw it up. And then he would sort of point you back in the right direction. But it's as if he had the wisdom to just let the crazies run the asylum, you know. I mean, he was very much in control. It was, you know, no question Arch was the boss. But he didn't meddle, you know, he just had his nice glasses and his gray beard and his red cardigan sweater and he just puttered around and make everybody feel, you know, very at home. My role really in this has been to be a teacher. I, I certainly was not a gung-ho uh, sales-driven person, I just was a teacher. And uh, if they understood that and we got along fine, I wasn't going to issue any grades. I don't think I've fired more than one person that I can think of. And I, it wasn't the case of, you're fired, clean out your desk. Because the guy that I did it, he wondered, he said, I wondered why you hadn't fired me before. The line that later I shared with, in conversations with Mitzi Clark and Barbara Potter and Uda Bear, we talked about Arch Harrison. And the one common thing we could also say about him was this was a man who had class, and we wanted to be a part of that operation. I would say that in general, um, I never met as many intellectually interesting cases under one roof as I did at JMA. I just there were just some, a lot of really interesting types there at JMA. You know, in radio, I met a lot of potheads and alcoholics. There's Commander Cody has a new album called uh, Dopers, Drunks, and Everyday Losers, and it reminds me of a lot of stations I've worked at. So JMA may have given me a little bit of an unrealistic notion of what radio was like. When Arch Harrison came to WJMA in the 1960s, the broadcasting industry's working population was primarily white males. As the country dealt with the turmoil of securing fundamental human and civil rights for people of all genders and colors, the atmosphere at WJMA remained calm and quiet. Without strife or protests of any kind, WJMA's staff makeup gently evolved on the leading edge of a new wave in America. I think he knew he was taking a chance. He never had had a woman on the air, at least not to cover a full air shift. I think he may have had some women who did news and things. He was great. We had a, we had a good relationship. Um, I don't know why, but we just clicked along. And he, he was very patient with me, extremely. Well, he's been that way all the long, I think, with everybody. Here were these perfectly competent, intelligent people. Why shouldn't they, if they wanted to do some broadcasting, come on in? I didn't even consider it groundbreaking, for heaven's sakes. It was just a good idea. He did not look at me as a difference in color. He looked at what I wanted to do and, and whether I was willing to put the work in to do it. Because if I was willing to do the work, he was willing to work with me on it. I didn't do it to represent anybody. I did it because, well, because it looked like it would be fun. And, and later on, I realized the importance of it because Arch opened a door that, and it wasn't because he had a policy against it, nobody had ever asked. Nobody had come and asked. Because I think that had somebody else come in with the same ability, they would have been first. Bob started with me as a high school uh, part-timer. He was a really good-spirited man, he was. A good sense of humor. He also had a very clear speaking voice. 
didn't have any accent of any sort. It just was really, really good. The time I spend here at WJMA is, is probably going to be what I'm going to consider to be the best times of my life. The 1970s was a new time with new ideas, new people, and new equipment. Harrison needed a new engineer. In fact, he reached a point where he was almost in a maintenance crisis. He called upon a man to come out of retirement and to the rescue at WJMA, a man who had begun tinkering with radios not long after Marconi broadcast the first wireless signal across the ocean in 1899. So he came in the front door with his box of tools, kind of shuffling along like that. Man, I just knew that heaven had smiled on us in the form of Gene Busset. He, he was a tenacious engineer. If we had a problem at uh, sign-on, the call Gene, if he couldn't fix it by telephone, he'd be over as soon as he could to, to uh, nose around and find out what was going wrong. I couldn't get the FM transmitter up one morning. And uh, Gene, uh, I called him. And I said, Gene, the, the FM transmitter won't come on. He says, open the door. I said, okay. Look down at the bottom. Do you see three black boxes down there? I said, yeah. Count over three and hit that box. So I counted over three and I tapped it. He said, no, 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 I didn't hear you. You really hit it. So I hit it and you could hear the relay snap and the things just came up and everything was fine. I didn't have, ever have to worry about engineering after Gene uh, came and joined us because I knew that we would be in good shape. He was, he was wonderful to work with. Uh, and he had no, I think you get to a certain age and, and he had reached that age, he had no, he wasn't trying to prove anything, he had already proven it. And so if this young upstart came in, he was just glad to have the help. That's the sense I got out of it. And uh, I think that once in a thousand times I could, maybe I told him something he didn't know. I mean, we both enjoyed that. It was that type of thing. It was, it was a remarkable experience. He was a sweet man. <laughs> he was so quiet. He would come in and do his whatever technical work. At that time, all of us who worked there were pretty young and lively and high energy and running all over the place drinking 10 cups of coffee a day. So there was a lot of hustle and bustle around. And then there was Gene, who, uh, he was just very slow and steady and methodical. Gene Basu was getting on in years. He was a tall man. He moved in a uh, motion similar to a combination of Tim Conway on the Carol Burnett Show and Lurch on the Adams Family. He was getting up there, you know, he was, uh, um, Pretty old and, and slow, but um, you know he'd he'd be fixing this or fixing that, and uh, just a very nice man. I do remember talking to him one time and asking him how he got interested in radio, how he got into the radio business. He said, "Well, when I was a kid, a friend of mine told me you could talk down the block without a wire." Like a lot of, probably a lot of our parents, he was definitely somebody who came of age during the Depression. And so he was not going to spend any money needlessly. And he would find a way to fix that equipment with taking parts out of other pieces of equipment or duct taping things together. He was really a, a magician in the way he kept the station running. Jean Basu, with his decades of experience, kept the station's signal on the air, strong and clear. But at times it seemed that WJMA ran not on electrons, but on mountains of paper. To deal with this challenge, another station hero emerged in the form of Pat Watson. Pat had been working in a grocery store up on Main Street, and I needed somebody to come and work in the radio station. And before she could come on the job, she was working in the butcher shop of this orange deli or something like that, chopped off a piece of one of her fingers. Did that stop Pat? No. <laughs> she was there with her finger all wrapped up and pecking away like that. And she never stopped. And that was what was really tenacious about her, was that she was a, a solid old country gal. And she just knew this is what she would like to do. And she did it for years and years and years and knew everybody. But don't get on a bad side. 
Uh, I got on her bad side for one week, and it was a miserable week. But Pat and I really got along well. We got along great, and she was so funny to Phil Goodman. And, uh, and Phil has his stories, <laughs> which he will tell you. <laughs> you went through three stages with Pat. The first stage was when she was breaking you in and you were new, and she would use your first name. She would say, Phil, this is not the way I need it. I need it this other way. Would you please do it this way because it makes it easier for me? Second stage was, Phil, we've talked about this. I've said it before. I say it now. Do it this way. Third stage of Watson was, Gooden, get up here. I got a bone to pick with you. Oh, Pat was a character. Just a wonderful character. She knew how to run that thing with her eyes shut. Everything about that station she was in on, and she would just tell everybody what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And um, she didn't care if she stepped on your toes or not. And would tell me if we had screwed up in somebody's name, we didn't get a play right, she would let us know that, you know, you should have done this. On the whole, we got along very well, and I really admired her for uh, her, just her concern. She had a passion for that place, I would call it. Uh, she wanted everything right. Patricia McCarver recalls doing a very fine, thoughtful story about Madison County. And when she came out of the control room, <laughs> Pat said, McCarver, what in the hell did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> that was, hey, fine, that was Pat all over you. you she was a really thoughtful, good-hearted woman. And uh, she just uh, was the heart and soul of that part of the station. Do you know where you know is? I remember doing a story about that one time. Maybe that was the one that Pat Watson said, what the hell was that all about? <laughs> She'd tell you what she thought, and if it wasn't good, well, that's just what she thought. And I, myself, I like that. I like people being honest and upfront and stuff like that. As you know, Pat was not one to mince words, and if she had some opinion about something you had done or something you had said, she'd let you know in a heartbeat. And her judgment was usually right on. So I grew to respect her a lot. Jay Kiernan holds an award that I used to hold, and I hope that I will never hold again. I forget the newscast, but I do remember I stumbled through the entire thing from the beginning to the end. And she looked at me and said, Gooden, that was the worst damn newscast I have ever heard in my life. And of course, I was confident that, you know, I, nobody would ever beat that. And then I get to the part where it says, uh, among the gunman's demands were that all white people leave the earth within seven days. <laughs> What can I do? <laughs> and I fell out. That was it. Started the next record. And Pat Watson, <laughs> as sweet as she always was, she came into the control room and gave me a look <laughs> like, you know, you moron. And she says, Cannon, that was the worst newscast I ever heard. And I guess she called me Robert. She called everybody by their last name, but I have no recollection of Pat and I ever having a head-to-head uh, -head confrontation or Pat being particularly um, critical of my program. I don't think she liked it, so she didn't listen to it. I remember frequently seeing Pat working at her desk with her head down, working on a paper or, or typing or something, and you would play a piece of music you knew Pat liked, and you would see her hand just reach up and turn up the monitor. And one thing that would always get Pat to turn up the monitor was a Conway Twitty song. Never failed. Uh, Arch had given her some work to do. And it was right toward the end of the day, and you know, she liked to get out of there at time. And she was giving him up and down the river, right there in the front office. And of course, me being a big mouth, I came out and said, Pat, you can't do that. He's the owner. He said, I don't give a damn if he is the owner. He knows better than this. When she got sick, um, I guess by that time I had left the station, but I remember calling on her in the hospital one time, and uh, her old beau, Roger, 
and said, I, I, don't, I don't know whether we're going to lick this thing or not, but we're going to give it a try. And so I, I, I went to see Pat. I wanted to see her. I wanted to tell her how much she had meant to me personally and to the station as a whole and to the community as a whole. She is really something special. So when she died, the funeral service was attended by half the town at uh, Preddy's funeral home. It was just a swarm of people there. It was just great.